This weekend, we continue our series of talking to some of the Mises Institute Summer Fellows. And our guest is Tate Fegley, who has combined a background in criminal justice with his interest in Austrian economics. So our topic this week is private police and private law, how criminal justice and crime and punishment might look in a more libertarian society. Tate and I discuss how the incentives for private police as opposed to government police are vastly different. Private police want to de-escalate conflicts and come to the most peaceable resolution without incurring any civil liability or harm to property owners' reputation or property itself. Tate and I also discuss the insurance model that would likely flourish in a private society versus the growth model that occurs today when state police departments clamor for bigger budgets when crime goes up. By contrast, both insurance companies and the people paying insurance premiums have a direct financial interest in preventing crime rather than arresting and incarcerating criminals at length. Would a private legal system using private competing defense agencies actually produce a society with far less violence at far lower cost? If you're interested in the topic of private police and private law, stay tuned for a fascinating interview with Tate Fegley. Welcome to Mises Weekends. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for coming to Auburn and spending your summer with us as a summer fellow. How is that experience going for you, and, and have you enjoyed having colleagues from so many different countries? Oh, absolutely. It's been a really great experience for me. You know, the Mises Institute really has a special place for me that a few years ago when I attended Mises U, it was almost like a week-long Christmas, just being able to interact with all these people who like to read about Austrian economics and libertarianism and those kinds of things. And being able to extend that to a whole summer um, has been a really great experience for me. And my colleagues here are really impressive. I often feel like <laughs> really outclassed. They just have so many different experiences being from all over. And you know, we hang out all the time. We play soccer a lot. Go get food to eat all the time. So really great experience. So your background is in criminal justice. And this is really a thorny area. It's oftentimes a sticking point for otherwise, from my perspective, sensible libertarians. In other words, a lot of libertarians and minarchists believe that the one thing that the state needs to provide and that has to exist to provide is some sort of criminal and civil justice system, and especially the enforcement mechanism of that, which we usually think of as police. So let's just talk about this conceptually for a moment. Why is it so hard for some or many libertarians to agree that police and justice systems can be provided in a private libertarian society? Well, I think part of the problem that people have in envisioning this is they don't see how police, competing police, can really interact with each other peacefully. Like if you read Ayn Rand, for example, like oh, what happens when two competing police agencies have a dispute? Like are they just to go to war? But when you realize that how policing is done you know, in a typical status system like the U.S., that it's operated like a monopoly. And so it behaves like a monopoly, that their costs of using violence are actually much smaller than they would be with a competing police force who has to bear the costs of going to war. Wars are expensive. And so being able to uh, have the taxpayer subsidize that cost really... Uh, gives one reason to believe that competing police forces really would have a much greater incentive to not use violence than the state does. When we look at private security, one example I've thrown out there in the past is Disneyland, which on any given day represents sort of a private city of sorts, maybe 25 or 30,000 people. And of course, their private security there is very unobtrusive and their incentives are very different from police. In other words, they want to avoid escalation. They want to avoid legal liability for harming someone. And they want to avoid bad press or any damage to the reputation of Disneyland. So it seems like a place like Disneyland where you have true private security, the incentives are wholly different than the incentives for your local police officer. Oh, yeah. This is you know true in any situation. Um, so a private policing service that I've looked at quite a bit myself is... Um, an organization called Threat Management Center in Detroit. And what's interesting looking at them is just how much more accountable as you know a private police force they are than the public police are. 
in pretty much every way, they have a greater accountability. They have um, greater financial accountability that if people are unsatisfied with their service, they can let them go. Whereas, you know, you get in a lot of trouble if you try not paying the public police. As you mentioned with Disney security, um, they want to avoid uh, civil lawsuits, whereas public police are often protected by qualified immunity laws, where if they make mistakes in the course of their duties, they can't be held civilly liable. And even if you know someone who was beaten up by the police successfully sues a police department, it's you know not coming out of any cop's pockets. It's the damages are paid by the taxpayer, essentially. I think another important part of that is contractual accountability that the Supreme Court has decided on multiple occasions that police don't have, or public police, don't have this duty to protect you, that even under the most negligent circumstances, if they fail to protect you, they can't be held liable. So essentially, they don't have to uphold their end of the social contract. Whereas with private police, you have an actual contract that if they fail to protect you, then they can be liable for a breach of contract. So I think the fact that private police as an institution are just so much more accountable really determines the incentive structure that they have to be more beholden to the clients they're supposed to serve rather than to the political classes. Well, you mentioned Detroit. Tell us a little bit more about what you found out studying Detroit. Was this private uh, defense agency of sorts that you mentioned, were they operating in the, the high criminal areas of Detroit, in rough areas? So they operate in a variety of areas. They have about 1,000 households that they serve and 500 businesses. And their paying clients are typically more upper scale communities that they provide these kind of Lamborghini style uh, services, as they call it, to protect them around the clock. But they also uh, serve a lot of lower income people that due to these profits that they make from serving uh, more wealthy people, um, they'll provide free services to domestic violence victims who are actually referred from the prosecutor's office to Threat Management Center, this business. Um, they will transport them to and from court, take their kids to school, or even guard them around the clock um, in more extreme circumstances. They will provide free self-defense training to uh, families with children. They will also, perhaps most interestingly, is provide free training to sworn law enforcement personnel. Uh, one night a week um, in you know, tactics to de-escalate situations and also training them in a martial art that's designed to not cause permanent injury so that there's fewer lawsuits. It's what I found kind of ironic is that despite the service that Threat Management Center provides, the Detroit police see them as a threat, as competition. They closely monitor them. They are pretty eager to catch them doing something wrong. But in their 20 years of existence, they haven't yet had any court dates for civil or criminal matters. Well, and as we've seen in recent months here in the U.S., in a lot of impoverished areas, the police are seen as the greatest threat of all. In other words, some of those communities might actually prefer no police, no government police, to the police that they're getting because of the police violence we've seen. And, and it seems to be unaccountable. Right, absolutely. Like like mentioned earlier that like these police they they don't have any accountability in terms of, you know, damages they may cause and they aren't really trained in a way to be service providers. The way they're trained is mostly to regard officer safety as the number one thing. And so in these high crime areas, it shouldn't be a surprise that that you have to depend on the goodness of their hearts rather than um, any other incentives that they may have. Right, rather than any market incentive. You know, both Rothbard and Hoppe talk about an insurance model when they talk about private police. And the insurance model posits that while both an insurance company and an insurance premium payer, the insured, have an incentive to prevent crime before it happens, whereas state police have a tendency to respond to crime. And when crime goes up, they don't get fired, but in fact, they clamor for a greater budget. So it seems that, that state police have a growth model. They almost benefit when crime increases, whereas a private model that's more dependent on insurance has a financial and a direct incentive to prevent crime and to keep crime low. When you look at some 
public policing agencies, like the way they're evaluated really provides them with these perverse incentives. So for example, some police unions, when they're uh, negotiating their budgets, they will use these measures of uh, performance and need. Performance is measured in terms of uh, arrests and need will be measured, as you mentioned, in terms of crime rates. Higher crime rates mean they need more, but from the perspective of what clients want, they would much rather have crimes prevented than you know, ever have, having them happen in the first place. And yet, to engage in kind of a proactive, preventative approach uh, negatively impacts both these measures, that there's fewer arrests and a lower crime rate. And so looking at the incentives-facing insurance model, it's much more costly to recover stolen property than it is to you know, prevent it from being stolen in the first place. So I think with the insurance model, you see the incentives of both the service provider and the customer are aligned much better than you do with a monopoly uh, police force that's paid by paid through taxes. What do you think arrest and incarceration would look like in a private system? Clearly, the, the agency has an incentive in not uh, warehousing criminals at a great expense for long periods. In the past, when there was less of a role for the state in the provision of you know, adjudication and dispute resolution, most... Uh, well, there wasn't even a criminal law. Most cases were treated as torts. And so most of the punishments, as we'd call them, were in the form of restitution. I think that a private society would rely much more on restitution, even for possibly uh, you know, violent crimes. Um, I'm also not sure whether a private society would uh, totally rule out the possibility of execution. Um, as far as Prisons, um, I, I know I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Robert Murphy's model of uh, private prisons, um, essentially taking prisoners, maybe training them, and uh, kind of collecting a debt that they might might be owed from. But yeah, I don't know what incarceration might look like. You know, what's so interesting about the restitution concept as opposed to the imprisonment concept is that it would presumably reduce or do away with a vast variety of victimless crimes, right? The, the restitution model relies on actual restitution for an actual victim as opposed to just taxing us as taxpayers to provide incar expensive incarceration for all of these crimes that didn't touch or affect us. I think that's why you have some you know, legal scholars like John Hasness or you know others in a more free market tradition just recommending get getting rid of the criminal law just have a civil law so that anything that would be considered a crime is there has to be a victim there has to be some party who's injured and will argue um, in court about how they've been injured yeah i think without a criminal law you wouldn't have these problems of victimless crimes that there'd have to be some identifiable victim to collect this restitution as the situation across the United States begins to look more and more like the situation in Greece or the situation in Detroit, I think we should all be thinking of how effective policing and how effective crime prevention might begin to unroll. Tate Fegley, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. <music>